to Mark chapter 5. And I, I only want to read verse 33 and 34. Actually, I'm just going to read verse 33. Because verse 33, everybody read verse 33. It says, but the woman fearing and trembling, knowing what was done in her, came and fell down before him and told him all the truth. Look at, she's fearing and trembling, knowing what was done in her. I want to use for a subject in your hearing, touch Jesus. Go ahead and touch Jesus. You may be seated in the presence of the Lord. Sunday school students know that what Matthew describes as the hem of his garment was basically tassels placed on the bottom of Jesus' outer robe. The importance which the later Jews attached to the hem or the fringe of their garments was founded upon the regulation in Numbers chapter 15, verses 38 through 39, which says, Speak unto the children of Israel and bid them that they make them fringes in the borders of their garments throughout their generations and that they put upon the fringe of the borders a ribbon of blue. And it shall be unto you for a fringe that ye may look upon it and remember all the commandments of the Lord and do them. And that ye seek not after your own heart and your own eyes after which ye used to go a whoring. There is only one way to touch the ribbon of blue. There's only one way to touch the hem of a garment, and that is by bending down. You can't touch the hem of a garment without bending down. This deliberate act on the part of this precious woman should not be overlooked. We should add to the imagination of this moment the thronging, the cramming and crowding of a large multitude of people, which to me means that the woman literally had to crawl to Jesus with the goal of touching something. She had to crawl to Jesus. Uh, I want you to write this down. With God, true humility is not embarrassing. It is attractive. With God, true humility. It's not embarrassing. It's attractive to God. When God sees true hu humility, God says, who is that? When he sees true humility, who's that man? It's attractive to God. Matter of fact, James chapter 4 verse 6 says, But he giveth more grace, wherefore he saith, God resisteth the proud, but giveth grace to the humble. <laughs> that, that's important, uh, especially young folk. That's important because we live in a society 
where uh, we seem to reward pride and dismiss and disregard humility. But my Bible says that God resists the proud and gives grace to the humble. I want you to write this down. This is a very important point. Some people miss their miracle moments because of a refusal to crawl. Some people miss their miracle moment because of a refusal to crawl. I have some bad news for many of us. Although we do not have to beg God for anything, we all must bow before him. And we will all bow before him either willingly or unwillingly, but we will bow. Let, let, me, let me tell you this. God breaks people. He, he breaks people. God breaks wills. God will knock a person down. Yes, he will. God will end plans. Now, y'all don't look at me so spiritual. Because I'm not only talking to the, the, the sinner. Because <laughs> God will break a saint. Come on, y'all. He will. He's done it to me. I didn't like it. At the time. But I love it now. God, God. God knows how to bring a person down a peg. He will humble us, especially when we don't listen, especially when we refuse to humble ourselves. God will get you. Come on, y'all. I need some amens. Yes, he will. God will get you. See, we always sin in God. Oh, we, 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 we. I, I don't mean this disrespectful. I'm just using this illustration. We treat God like he's our personal pit bull. Sick him, God. Go get him, God. We always know who God's going to get. Everybody say, but God knows my number. No, say it to yourself. Say, God knows my number. Some people are going, I'm going to say, I'm going to stay here for about three minutes. Some people will miss their miracles because of an unwillingness to humble themselves. Huh. Peter said, humble yourselves therefore under the mighty hand of God that he may exalt you in due time. Some people will miss their miracles because of an aversion to lower themselves. Just an aversion. I don't want to lower myself. And God is pressing on your head and, and telling you lower. And there's an aversion to lower yourself. And you're going to miss your blessing. Jesus said, and whosoever shall exalt himself shall be abased and he that shall humble himself shall be exalted tell your neighbor the quickest way up is down i know that doesn't make sense i i know it's not a law of gravity but but it's a law in god the quickest way up anybody trying to go up go down some people will miss their blessing because they're too proud to apologize.
too proud to lose in the eyes of others. It has been my personal experience. Turn everything off over there. Turn it all off. Just go over somebody, just turn it all off because it's going to mess up my message. Turn the organ off, the keyboards off, and if that don't work, un just start unplugging stuff. Worst case scenario, we jump on the piano and still hear something. That's all right, I'm going to say it again. It has been my personal experience Now we made it worse. You're going to find it. We'll find it. Everybody say, bless him, Lord. It has been my personal experience. I told you he was going to find it. Give God praise. It has been my personal experience that some emotions simply interfere with the mindset needed to truly worship the Lord in spirit and in truth. Some emotions just get in the way of our worship. Go to Matthew chapter 5, verse 23. Why is this important? Because God's getting ready to bless you. God's getting ready to pour you out a blessing you can't understand. But before you go there, we got to go here. He says in verse number 23, Therefore, if thou bring thy gift to the altar, And there rememberest that thy brother hath a what? An ought against thee. Leave there thy gift, where? Before the altar. And go thy way. First, be reconciled to thy brother. And then, everybody say, and then. Come and offer thy gift. Everybody say, then come offer thy gift. Eliot's commentary breaks this down really well, and I quote, These words describe an act which would appear to men as a breach of liturgical propriety. To leave the gift and the priest the act of sacrifice unfinished would be strange and startling. Yet that our Lord teaches were better than to sacrifice with the sense of a wrong unconfessed and unatoned for and unreconciled, better than the deeper evil of not being ready to forgive. Eliot says, it is not enough to see in this only a command to remove ill will and enmity from our own mind, though that, of course, is implied. There must be also confession of wrong and the endeavor to make amends to bring about, as far as in us lies, reconciliation or atonement, In quote. I have found that it is impossible to worship like I want to worship when I'm mad. Is that too real? I have found that, that, that I can't worship God like I want to when I'm mad. I found that anger interrupts my worship. I found that being upset can impact my worship. I'm just going to talk about me because y'all have been saved so long and you can just do that. 
I found that even being hurt can affect my praise. It, being disturbed can affect my praise. But you know what? I had to decide. I decided I'm not going to let a grudge mess up my worship. And whenever you have to choose between holding on to something and worship, let that thing go. Hello, somebody. Let bitterness go. Let dislike go. Let resentment go. Let loathing go. Why? So that I can worship God like I want to worship him. So I can serve him like I want to serve him. So we can do what God has called us to do. That's why the Hebrew writer says in Hebrews chapter 12, verses 14 and 15, follow peace with all men and holiness without which no man shall see the Lord looking diligently lest any man fall of the grace of God, lest any root of bitterness springing up trouble you and thereby many be defiled. I, I'm going to say it again. Many people will miss their miracle because of a, of a refusal to crawl. My precious brothers and sisters, humility is a prerequisite to deliverance. Which also means that humility is a prerequisite to worship. Second Chronicles chapter 7 verse 14 says, If my people, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways then will I hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and will heal their land I fully expect a full worship here and online today as we reflect on what Jesus has done for us and how he did it. And the end result ought to be the kind of pure worship that comes from gratitude. Pure worship. Our text is not only a recreation of a miracle, it is also a recreation of a worship moment. The act of touching is symbolic of worship because it is in worship and through worship and by worship that we touch Jesus today. And our text is one of the many examples of what happens when faith and worship are combined. When faith, a confidence in what Jesus can do, and worship, a gratitude of what he has done, are combined. Let me talk a little bit about worship. Worship is an act. It's an action. Worship is a deed. Worship is an achievement. Worship is not what we say we do. So a lot of people that say, I'm a worshiper, but there's no record of you actually worshiping. Worship is not what we say we do or what we say we will do or what we hope to do eventually. Worship is not something promised to God if he's obedient to us. Some people are treating God, Lord, I'll praise you if you bless me. Tell your neighbor, don't do that. Worship is a lifestyle. Worship is a life. Uh, worship is not an afterthought 
but a forethought. Worship doesn't say, Lord, if you get me out of this. Worship says, Lord, I know you're going to get me out. Worship doesn't say, Lord, when you get me out. Worship says, Lord, you got me out. Worship doesn't say, Lord, I know you can make a way. Worship says, I'm out. Anybody here can just praise God because you out? As a matter of fact, there are some of us that are still worshiping God for what he has already done. We haven't even gotten to worshiping God for what he is doing or what he's going to do. So we see this in the text. Notice how before the miracle, she was determined to simply touch him with expectation of being healed. But after the miracle, she falls down trembling, explaining, testifying, and worshiping. L let me just say this to somebody. When your trial is over, the explanation of what Jesus has done for you will bring you to your knees. But not in a bad way. It's going to bring you to your knees in worship. Ah, your current trial. The thing you're going through right now. When it's over, you're going to fall on your knees every time you tell it. And your current trial will be the fuel of your future worship. As a matter of fact, let me just pause right now and, and ask you a question. How did you make it the last two and a half years? Hello, somebody. How, how did you handle COVID? I, I would ask everybody that, that, that uh, experienced COVID firsthand to raise your hand, but I don't want the person sitting next to you to start scooting over. Hello. COVID was a joke until you got it. Couldn't pronounce it. Called it COVID, COVID, the COVID, whatever it was. It, it was what it was until you got it. And then uh, until you couldn't breathe. Until you lost your taste. Until you got a positive result. And until you had to deal with it. And now, then, whenever it happened, you had to deal with it. And, and however you had to deal with it, so, somebody had to deal with it, you had to force yourself to just sit still. Because you couldn't, you couldn't fight COVID. Boy, if we could fight COVID, you just duke it out. But, but you just had to wait. How did you handle isolation when, when there was a stay-at-home order? How, how, did, how did you handle, I know y'all are so glad you, they, they said the kids are going back to school. How, how, did you, how did you handle it? Now, when you began to explain how you dealt with it, your explanation ought to be a worship. Well, I had to trust God. I didn't know what I was going to do. I didn't know how I was going to make it. I, did, I didn't think I was going to make it. We have people in this room that was in the hospital for, for days and weeks and months. People online that, that are still dealing with the aftermath of COVID. We have people that are dealing mentally with the aftermath of isolation. Oh, it's real. But your testimony, how did you handle, how are you handling the back-to-back-to-back-to-back -to -back -to -back -to -back deaths in your family? In this church, there were some weeks we had three funerals in a week. 
and had to push the fourth one off to the next week. How did we do that? Everybody say, the Lord helped us. And so when you think about that, when you think about it, you ought to give God some praise. When we say, when I think of the goodness of Jesus and all he's done for me, my soul cries out. Hallelujah. Praise God for saving me. I don't have to go back to my day of salvation to praise him. I don't have to go back 20 years ago to praise him. Anybody here have something that you ought to pray, that you are praising? I'm not just saying God has been good like it's a rumor. I heard God was good. Hallelujah. Somebody help me preach. God is good right now. And if it had not been for the Lord that was on my side, tell me where would I be? Would have lost my mind, would have lost my joy, would have lost my salvation, would have lost my home, would have lost my everything, would have, could have lost it all. Somebody shout, but God. The Bible says the woman was fearing and trembling and she came and fell and told him all the truth. She said, now, now, now she's on her knees. She's on her knees. She said, he healed me. My, I've been bleeding for 12 years, 12 years, and I went to every doctor in town, and no doctor could help me. They took my money, but they couldn't help me. I spent every dime I had, and nobody could help me. And when I heard Jesus was in town, I told myself, I said, whatever I have to do, I'm going to get to Jesus. Has anybody ever been right where I'm at right now? Oh, whatever I got to do. If I, I'm going to walk, I don't care what they say about how I smell. I don't care what they say about what I'm wearing. I don't care what they say about how I look. I don't care if they kick me. I don't care if they push me down. I don't care if they tell me to get up from there. I'm going to touch Jesus. And as soon as I touched the hem, I couldn't get to his arm. I couldn't get to his hand. I couldn't get to the, all I could do was just touch the hem. And when I touched the hem of your garment, immediately I felt the blood stop. And I knew I was healed. I knew I was healed. I knew I was healed. I'm trying to tell you. If you don't get down like this every now and then, if you don't humble yourself every now and then, oh, she would have missed her miracle if she was too proud to crawl. She would have missed her miracle if she was too proud to get on her hands and knees and reach out to Jesus. And my prayer for this word is that you that are watching me are not too proud to bend yourself, to lower yourself, to be humble before God. Now let me shift the Bible study mode because I want you to write down 10 signs that we have touched Jesus. Because somebody wants to know, how do you know if you touch him? Hmm. One is closeness. And when you touch Jesus, you feel a closeness. David said, yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, when, when, when you touch Jesus, 
you know he's with you. <laughs> Number two, you know you've touched Jesus because you feel peace. John 14, 27, Jesus said, peace I leave with you. And my peace I give unto you, not as the world giveth, give I unto you. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. So you know you've touched Jesus when you feel his peace. Number three, power. When you touch him, you feel his power. Uh, Acts chapter 1 verse 8 uh, Jesus said but you shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you and ye shall be witnesses unto me both in Jerusalem and in Judea and in Samaria and unto the uttermost parts of the earth you know you touch Jesus because you feel that power Number four, you speak in tongues. I like what Acts 2 and 4 says. And they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. When you touch Jesus, has anybody ever had a praise party that turned into a worship party that turned into a Holy Ghost tongue talking party? You touch Jesus, you start speaking in tongues as the Spirit gives utterance. As a matter of fact, you can speak in tongues all the way home. Hello, somebody. You wake up in the morning, just talk to God in tongues. And why? Because you know you've touched Him. There's an exchange that happens as we speak to God in tongues. And I talk to people who say, I haven't spoken in tongues in years. Don't do that no more. Speak every day. Hello, somebody. Because as you touch Jesus, he touches your back. Number five, strength. When you touch him, you feel strength. Acts chapter 4 verse 31 says, And when they had prayed, the place was shaken where they were assembled together, and they were filled with the Holy Ghost and spake the word of God with boldness. When you touch Jesus, he'll give you strength to be bold. And you can declare things after a touch that you couldn't declare before the touch. Anybody ever gone into prayer with one testimony and came out with something totally different? Number six, when you touch him, you develop a sensitivity to sin. Ephesians chapter four, verse 30 says, and grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby ye are sealed unto the day of redemption. When you touch Jesus, when you come in contact with Jesus, you can leave his presence and go out and commit sin. I'm going to say it one more time. You can leave a touch with Jesus and go out and sin. You didn't touch him. You, you faked that one. You pretended to praise him. You acted like you were worshiping. You did your mirror dance. But that wasn't a touch of Jesus. Because when you touch him, you don't want to grieve his spirit. And you don't want to mess up what he's already done in your spirit. Number seven, when you touch Jesus, you feel love. Uh, Romans chapter five. Verse 5 says the love of God is shed abroad in your hearts by the Holy Ghost which is given unto us. Something about his love. He deposits love in your heart. When you touch him, 
he leaves some love behind. Ooh, I feel like I'm preaching. Boy, I ought to shout, but I can't. Um, he leaves some love behind, and he sheds that love in your heart. Aren't you glad he don't put the love in your feet? He don't put the love in your hands. He don't put, he puts the love in your heart. Somebody ought to say he puts love in my heart. He says it shed abroad, not your physical heart, but your spiritual heart. He just fills our hearts with love. It's hard to hate and love at the same time. You got to make your mind up. Are you going to love? You going to follow that love that he left in your heart? Or are you going to put a, a hole in your heart so that the love can drain out? But I don't know about you. Whenever I have a good worship, I get up from there and I feel the love of God in my heart. Number eight. When you touch him, there is a sense of awe by the feeling of his presence. Oh, Isaiah 66 verses 1 and 2 says, Thus saith the Lord, the heaven is my throne and the earth is my footstool. Where is the house that ye built unto me? And where is the place of my rest? For all those things hath mine hand made, and all those things have been, saith the Lord. But to this man I will look, even to him that is poor and of a contrite spirit, and trembleth at my word. You don't have a sense of awe by the presence of God then you haven't touched him. But when the Lord walks in your room, when the Lord walks in your prayer closet, when the Lord walks in your worship, there is a sense of awe. Oh, how awesome God is. How amazing God is. How wonderful God is. You don't want to leave that atmosphere. Somebody say amen. Number nine. Ah, uh, his touch leaves a strong desire to worship. Uh, Psalm 16 and 11 says, Thou wilt show me the path of life. In thy presence is fullness of joy. At thy right hand there are pleasures forevermore. Everybody say, in his presence. Ah, uh, there is a strong desire to worship. That's why we love our worship music because it reminds us of his presence. Number 10, when we are touched, when we touch Jesus, we are miraculously altered. A-L-T-E-R-E-D. Like the woman with the issue of blood, Jesus performed surgery on her without a scalpel, he performed surgery laser surgery without a laser he cut her without cutting her he sealed what he sealed without a suture without nothing but a touch somebody shall touch me jesus and jesus is saying to you you touch me Ah, uh, today we can say if I could touch but the hem of his garment, I would feel closeness. If I could touch the hem of his garment, I'll feel peace. If I touch the hem of his garment, I'll feel power. If I touch the hem of his garment, I'll speak in tongues as the Spirit gives utterance. If I touch the hem of his garment, I'll, I'll become sensitive to sin. Uh, when you touch the hem of his garment, you realize what you thought was okay. It's not okay with God. 
what everybody is doing is not okay with God. Today we say, if I could touch the hem of his garment, I feel loved. If I could touch the hem of his garment, I'll have a sense of awe by the feeling of his presence. If I could touch the hem of his garment, I'll have a strong desire to worship him. If I could touch the hem of his garment, I will experience a miraculous change. Ask your neighbor, have you touched Jesus? Have you touched Jesus lately? And if you haven't, let me pause and tell you to touch him. Ah, uh, just do a circle around you and tell everybody, touch him. Touch him. Tell five people, touch him. Touch him. Touch him. Touch him. Touch him. Now give God praise in this house. So now the question becomes, how can we touch Jesus today? I'm glad you asked. As you know, there are many types of touching. There is a physical touch. There is an emotional touch. When you watch TV, when you hear a song, it touches you. Then there is a spiritual touch. That's the touch that only God can do. God can touch us in a way that no one can. God can touch your mind. God can touch your heart. God can touch your body. God can touch your soul. God can touch your bones. God can touch your spirit. God can touch your veins. God can touch your blood. God can touch in a way that nobody can. Glory be to God. Some touching is invisible. However, just because it's not seen doesn't mean it did not happen. We can see this in the text. It was the act of touching that created the miracle. Write this down. There are three ways to touch Jesus today. There's actually five. I've got two more at the end. But three, one is you touch him with your faith. Jesus told her, he says, your faith hath made you whole. Number two is you touch him with your heart. She said within herself, if I could just touch the hem of his garment. And number three, we touch him with our trust. When you trust God, it moves him. As a matter of fact, I want to say this. This is consistent with the thought I said earlier. Some of us are missing the opportunity to touch Jesus because touching him is uncomfortable. Write this down. The modern insistence of comfort is having an adverse effect on our worship. This is for the young folks. This is for the young people. It's a little unfortunate that you missed out on what church was like for those of us that grew up in the country or that grew up in uh, wood church frame buildings. I know I'm going to lose a whole lot of folk at Church of Christ, but I, I, I wonder if there's anybody that remembers going to a church that had wood floors. And, and those wood floors didn't have carpet anywhere. And what would they tell you to do? Get on your knees. Now, now, now we lost half the a congregation right there. Just uh, I, I might get on my knees, but, but on the floor, uh, yeah, 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 I remember 
I remember churches that had one toilet in the whole building. And it was in a little room at the back of the sanctuary. And when somebody went in there and they came out, the whole back row was like, woo! Anybody go to a church like that? Just, just wave at me. I just know what I'm talking about. I remember church when there was one microphone. Everybody, that was it. And it was connected to the one speaker in the whole building. I, they didn't have, they, it, was just, it was just one. And the preacher, the preacher was preaching to hundreds of people with that one microphone. Uh, anybody remember when the piano in the church was out of tune? It didn't matter what key you were singing in, the piano wasn't going to play it anyway. Put me in F sharp. Bang. That's B flat. Uh, no, that's F sharp right there. It's just out of tune. Uh, hello, somebody. Am I telling the truth? Uh, it was the piano drum set there was a snare drum over there and a bass drum over there it wasn't a drum line we just had two people playing and it may be a mallet on the bass drum it may be a shoe but that was the rhythm section with the tambourine that had one little symbol on it hanging on for dear life Clink, 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 clink. Tambourine was busted. If your hand, somebody got happy, poop, da, poop, da, plop. And then they just kept on. That's why there's some tambourines didn't have no centers in them. Uh, because Sister and their crown over kept busting the tambourines. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They had a scrap board in there. I'm going somewhere. Uh, we were parking on a dirt parking lot. Wash your car on Saturday and go down south and they ain't have no parking lot. You just pull on to the dirt and hope it didn't rain. Three hour services. Hello, a testimony service was an hour. And then everybody wanted to stand up at the 45 minute mark. And you know, we didn't complain about how long service was. We wasn't looking at our watch talking about we started at 11 it's three o'clock we we didn't do that we didn't uh why because for some reason we were engaged in service back in those days prayer partners had two roles number one the prayer partners would pray in tandem you pray while i catch my breath and then I'll pray while you catch your breath. But there was another reason that you needed a prayer partner. Help me up. Help me. Somebody. <laughs> Help me up. I've been down here so long. I, I, I didn't fall and I can't get up. I've been on my knees so long. I can't get up. Young people, you're going to have to pray until it hurts. You, you're going you're gonna to have to, you, you, can't, you can't get comfortable. Uh, 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 follow me, brother, cameraman, or sister camera woman. You, 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 sometimes, you know, we want, we're trying to be like the old folk. And we want to just sit up in our seat and pray. We want, we want to sit up and pray like the old folk. They don't get it, do they, evangelist ship? You're not sitting up because you want to be comfortable. You can't get down. But when you could, you was on both knees. Anybody remember praying and you went from this <laughs> 
Anybody remember praying until you could smell the wood in the bitch? Anybody remember praying and wiping your own saliva off the bitch so you won't sit in it? Somebody like, all right, pastor, you know. Now, now what you're dealing with, you ain't going to get through that sitting up praying with your phone in your hand. Praying while you're getting text messages at the same time. Somebody say, pray through. Pray until. Pray until when? Until something happens. Well, how long is that going to be? I ain't got all day. Yes, you do. I ain't got all week. Yes, you do. You may have to pray all day. You may have to pray all night. And when you pray, humble yourself. Get as low as you can and it may be this is as low as you can go and that's all right lower everybody say lower something i'm preaching this morning lower lower your eyes your eyelids lower your head lower something as a sign of humility because that's how you're going to touch that's how you're going to touch the lord you got to pray until your back is sore. You got to pray until it hurts. The good news is that we know who we are praying to. This reminds me of the words of Hebrews chapter 4, verse 15 and 16, where he says, For we have not an high priest which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities, so Jesus knows your knees hurt because he is hurt. Jesus knows your back hurts because he is hurt. Jesus knows you're tired because he was tired. Jesus knows you're uncomfortable because he was uncomfortable. Jesus can be touched with the feeling of our infirmities. Because he was in all points tempted like as we are, yet without sin. My brothers and sisters, Jesus was touchable. And Jesus is touchable. But we have to extend ourselves to touch him. Jesus is relatable. But we have to reach out to touch him. Jesus is touchable, but we have to want to touch him. Somebody help me preach and just tell your neighbor, say neighbor, keep touching him. Ah, uh, we are not in a position where we have to say, I touched him one time, but you can touch him Several times you can touch him with the feeling of your infirmities. You can touch him with your grief. You can touch him with your tears. You can touch him with your sorrows. You can touch him with your pain. You can touch him with your problems. You can touch him by your desire to get close to him. You can touch him by your desire for more peace. You can touch him by your desire for more power. You can touch him with your praise and worship. Come on, put your hands together. Celebrate God. 